We have uh, just a few topics today, and they're things to sort of fill in gaps and pockets in the language uh, that that seemed necessary once I started uh, making bigger, more real code. You know, so far we've had at the beginning, especially very small, simple programs. Last time I started doing some threaded stuff that was a little hairier. Um, you know, now. I'm doing stuff like an audio mixer, which is is not just threaded, but it's actually trying to do real work in a thread, right? Which the the, the previous demos were uh, just arbitrary example code in a thread, although we did launch like 10,000 threads or whatever we did last time. Um, but uh, you know, and, and next time um, we're going to do a really interesting feature that's the kind of thing that very few languages do. But in the meantime, um, there's some features that are just very helpful for making robust uh, code. And um, it felt important to me to do them right and uh, get them in early. So we're going to talk about those things now. So the first thing we're going to talk about is array bounds checking. Um, here, uh, here's our little, well, let's run it and show, oh, I don't have a terminal. Why don't I, why did I close my terminal? All right. So, all right, we will uh, go VC X64. Mm. Okay, so we've just compiled today's demo program in the usual way. We're just going to make debug builds all day today, because why not? Uh, and let me run it. So, you know, we're printing out some values in some arrays. That's, that's no big surprise, but I always think it's good to look at what we're doing uh, before we actually go and do the program. All right, so uh, our first function here is called array bounds checks. And what we do is we just iterate over numbers from zero to n minus one, and we fill in this array called the array. So n is four, and the array is four floats. And we're filling in this array called the array uh, with float versions of this iterator, right? So uh, that's pretty simple. You get 0, 1, 2, and 3 in item 0, 1, 2, and 3. Uh, it's a very short array, and so you might imagine it's easy to overrun the bounds of that array accidentally. Um, now, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do this common mistake where I'm going to iterate from 0 to n minus 1, or, or to n, right, which is actually n plus 1 different items because we're being 0 based. Um, now, some languages make their dot dot operator not include the thing on the right, which is a little, that, I think that asymmetry is a little weird, so I didn't want to do that this time, but we might do it later. That's not really important to what I'm talking about here. All, all that matters is right now, this loop visits every integer from 0 to n inclusive of both ends. Right? That's what dot dot means in the language right now. Um, so we're iterating over all that, and we're saying, we're going to say, uh, we're going to print that the array bracket, and then whatever number that we're iterating over, and then is blah, and we're going to dereference the array that we just initialized, right? And so that's what's generating these print statements here. So array 0 is 0, array 1 is 1, array 2 is 2, array 3 is 3. Um, but that's actually these functions that generated that output. I just uncommented this one, which happens before those. I'm sorry, I'm explaining this a little bit nonlinearly. Uh, but let's see what happens when I now that I've uncommented this, right? So we're going to compile, we're going to run, uh, and we get a panic because um, the array bounds check failed. Uh, it's telling us index four, and the array is four elements long, and the site where this array bounds check failed is in demo line 45, and we can indeed jump to line 45 and see that it is this line. So that's very handy. Right away, um, built into the compiler, we don't have to run some cumbersome external tool, right? The compiler right away can tell us where these problems occur. Now, how does that happen? Well, there's an option that you can turn on in configuration that just any time an array reference occurs, just a little bit of extra code is uh, inserted into the generated code, right? that just checks the bounds of this array subscript. It's very simple. If you're an experienced programmer, you totally know what I'm talking about. 
Sometimes in C++ you might like build an array class that has this built in as an option, but what we're going to do here is far superior to that and I'll demonstrate why now. So here um, we're calling three different functions to print the array and they're all more or less the same and let's go look at them. Um, ooh, I guess I didn't check in. I might have to modify this on the fly a little later. I didn't check in some things from today. Okay, it should be good enough. Sorry, I did. I just did a little bit of uh, re-spacing of this to make it more readable. I did something like this. And I didn't check it in. Anyway, um, so this first uh, print A of this array, right? It doesn't. Again, this is like a templated or polymorphic procedure. We don't care what type of the array is. We're just going to print all the items, right? I could put some spacing there. Um, and this is correct. We're just iterating over things that are in the bounds of the array. That's all fine. Uh, now, version B here intentionally has a mistake, but you'll notice, um, well, if I go, if I go recomment out this thing that tripped that array bounds check and I rerun, um, we didn't actually catch that one. And why? And the reason is because we told the compiler not to look. We have this directive called no ABC, which is short for no array bounds check. And you can do that either at expression scope right before the subscript or at block scope. Here we say no array bounds check and everything in this block is not array bounds checked. Why would you do that? Well, um, Array bounds checking is useful, but it's also really terrible for a high performance program because your inner loops may often be things that dereference arrays. Now in a language like C, if you're trying to do inner loops kind of fast, you might like have pointers or whatever. Um, but one of the ideas of this language is that you pass around arrays usually instead of pointers and that lets you write more robust code for little or no performance cost, right? Um, so we have the ability anytime that we're passing data around to bounds check it, which is very useful. Uh, but, um, you know, like, like the way this kind of bounds checking works today in most uh, low level languages like this is that you have your regular build that you run all the time. And then once in a while, when you want to debug some things, then you use some other tool like Valgrind or Purify or something, right? Something like that, that, instruments the code and, and does the checks and that is a very slow and painful process and so you don't do it very often um, and it's not very fun when you do it it's really an annoying and stupid right uh, but here you get these checks automatically and you can put no abcs around your inner loops and your performance sensitive parts of your code right and what that means is that your code will still run fast and almost all of it will be bounds checked except for the parts that you explicitly say not to bounds check right and that means you can leave this turned on in your debug build all the time right it's never a problem um, it's not going to slow you down appreciably uh, and you're happy right your, your code gets checked it's great um, now so far I've just said that we're bounds checking arrays uh, but this works on strings as well actually let me um, let me just demo so here we're running fine um, just to show that this no ABC, by the way, we're running fine, right? But if you look, we're obviously iterating too far over these arrays and this zero is a garbage value that we're getting out, right? Um, that's why this doesn't say four is because it's not initialized because we're reading past the end of the array. In theory, this could be any random number, but we're getting kind of lucky and getting a zero. Okay, uh, you know, if I comment out no ABC here, right, and I rerun, then it finds it, right? So that's very powerful. And that's something that's very hard to do with an external tool, right? Because again, I can do it at block scope here and we'll see some more examples of doing this at block scope. I can just say, oh, this whole block, there's no bounce check in there. And right here I have this, this happens to be at function scope, but you can do it at local blocks inside other blocks at arbitrary granularity. Okay. Um, now this also works on strings uh, and the reason is because we don't use zero terminated strings anymore. In previous demos we use C style strings and zero terminated strings unfortunately are how you get owned almost all the time when a hacker attacks you. Uh, so they're kind of a bad idea. Um, 
so you know when you pass around a string that has an explicit length like strings in Pascal do and some other languages then again just like just like we say it's a good idea to pass arrays everywhere instead of pointers because you can bounds check them it's a good idea to pass a string uh, that has an explicit length everywhere as opposed to um, you know a string that has an implicit length somewhere inside because you can't really test that implicit length right but here you can um, even you know even if you're doing like a binary string in C you might explicitly as the programmer pass a length parameter and a data parameter but the compiler doesn't know that those two things correspond right so it can't really use them to do automatic uh, checking but here we can right so here we've got the string hello sailor and we're just iterating from 0 to 14 and we're printing all the characters and again it'll be no surprise that 14 is too far, right? This string isn't 14 characters long. However, we've got a no array bounds check here, which is why we're successfully running. Um, well, did I, did I re-uncomment the other one? I don't remember. Yeah. So this is us printing out this uh, string, s sub whatever is whatever. We're subscripting the string just like you would an array. Um, and when we hit 14, uh, we're getting a zero, which is again just a garbage character, right? If I delete this no ABC, you will find that we get a bounce check failed, right? So that's cool. Um, here's another example. Uh, you know, just this is uh, so far those were arrays, you know, on the stack or in static space. Here we've got a vector three. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I'm newing an array of n of those again, right? And I'm explicitly subscripting number five, which is even one further past where you should go. However, right, again, we've got a no ABC. This is a local block, right, within our function. Um, and no ABC is applying at block scope. L let me go back. Uh, so here we're running the whole thing now. And this is us printing our erroneous array. You know, it should be 149, but as you can see, it's not. It's like minus zero and plus zeros. And that's because these are garbage values, right? And again, uh, if I just get rid of the no ABC, hey, look, we caught it. So that's, you know, that's something off the heap and something off the whatever. Um, now, this is a lexical construct, right? So, um, is not a dynamic construct. So it takes no runtime overhead, but it also means that if I call print v3 in here and print v3 uh, disables the bounce check, um, then uh, it'll be disabled. Or, or how do I say that? Or if, v if v3 had a bounce check enabled um, and it actually does the subscript, <laughs> it'll be enabled, right? In this case, it doesn't do the subscript. The subscript is already happens at the calling site. But the point is, this is a lexical construct and not a dynamic construct. Um, all right, so other things that get bounce checked, well, you know, you have regular regular arrays or AOS arrays, right? SOA arrays are also bounce checked. Uh, so that's not too big of a surprise. So, um, but let's demo it. Here's an SOA array that's N wide and, um, you know, if I do this, that'll trip a bounce check as well. You know, um, line 93, right, which is there. Uh, but uh, the interesting thing, you know, I've demoed it previous times, that you can take pointers to elements of an SOA array, and those are sort of fat pointers. They take 264-bit words to, to do the job of pointing at what they're pointing at. Um, but what that really means, the reason why they're fat pointers is because that fat pointer contains array information. So we can actually bounds check when you dereference an SOA pointer, even though the mental model is that it's a pointer and not an array. Um, so uh, yeah, let's just show that. Um, remember, this means uh, take a pointer to. It's sort of the opposite of what it means in C, right? In a declaration, this means the same thing as in C, which means in use, it's the opposite. Uh, this means take the address of v sub n minus 1, right? Okay, so that's fine. We've got a pointer to a valid item because this is n items long. We print that item, right? And then we add one. And let's go back to a validly running program again. Uh, so we, we print the, the z element. It's 9. That's fine. Now we've incremented the pointer to one past something valid. 
but we're not dereferencing it yet. Uh, so let's dereference that and show that that trips an array bounds check, right? Whoops, wrong window. Yep, so there we go. In line 106, array bounds check failed. So that's interesting, again, because your mental model is this is a pointer, but um, under the hood, every SOA pointer is really an array. Uh, so other things like, so that was dereferencing a, a member of it, right? But you can also get a bounds check error if you just dereference the whole struct. That's kind of obvious, but, you know, we'll demo it. Okay. So that's array bounds checking, um, sort of. <laughs> I, for, I forgot to say something. Let me, let me show you how you set this up. So here's my setup uh, function. Um, this is, uh, again, in exactly the same programming language. If you don't know how this program is being built, you can look at earlier demos. Um, but basically what happens is at compile time, we run this thing that sets some build options, tells the compiler that they changed, and then tells us to uh, run that other file over there, right? Or, or add it for a build, um, and then it gets built. And the th setting that we changed here is array bounds check mode. Um, that's set to on, right? And that's something you would do in a debug build. Uh, for a release build, you would say off probably, right? So, um, so let me let me go intentionally turn on and let's go back to that very first bounds check violation and turn that on. Now we will not catch it, right? So now we're going too far in the array. It's four and we get a zero. And the reason we don't check it is because uh, we set this to off. Now, remember I said <laughs> that one of the reasons it's great to have this built into the compiler is it's very selective and you have a great deal of control. And you can do this checking almost everywhere in your program, but have your program be performant because in all your inner loops, you turn off the bounds checking. That's what no ABC is for. However, sometimes a day comes when things are being crazy and your program isn't behaving as expected and there's just some really bad bug somewhere and you don't know why, right? And in those times, uh, it pays to be very paranoid. Let me, let me make sure, did I turn that off? Yeah, so we're successfully running again. Um, but as you know, we've got these bounds check failures in here that are sort of in the inner loops of our code. They're in the parts that we trust, and maybe we're wrong about trusting those, right? Maybe they actually have errors in them. So for paranoid people, we have this mode, array bounds check mode, always, right? And what always does is it ignores no ABC, right? So now everything here is going to get bounds checked even though it has no ABC, right? So here we fail right away in line 48. Um, whoops, <laughs> sorry. Okay, so now we fail uh, in line 34, right? Which is this one where there is a no ABC, but we're ignoring that, right? Because we're on always. If we go just back to on, we're going to ignore that one and we'll successfully run, right? So you have the ability to toggle your program between a fast bounce check everything but our inner loops and a slow, I'm super paranoid right now, check everything, right? I, I want to know everything about everything. So that's array bounce checking. Okay. Next topic. Where's my main? I usually put main at the bottom, but I put it at the top today. Let's talk about here strings. Uh, let's, let's run again. Now we're just printing out some weird strings. Uh, <laughs> we're not we're not doing too well with the with the Hindi script here, but um, the other ones are fine. Uh, anyway, the, it's the console that doesn't like this. It's like not dealing with the spacing well. But uh, so we're printing out these nice strings, and you know they're big long strings. And sometimes you want to print program code. Sometimes you want to manipulate program code um, so that you can generate other code that you then compile. And in a language like this, which gives you a lot of facilities for metaprogramming, you want it to be easy to manipulate those strings, right? But the problem is you end up in this situation where you got to like backslash stuff. And then maybe you have to backslash your backslashes. Like if you're going to process things in certain ways, um, it's really annoying. 
so we take a queue from shell script land, and we have this thing called here strings. Um, so look, at, you know, this function is just a very simple. We're saying print test one in some variable called test one, some variable test two, test three, test four, right? And what are those? Sorry, I, Emacs has frozen on me. When Casey and I complain about Emacs, this is what we're talking about. What is it doing? Emacs, you so fail. Um, I don't even know now. I guess I'm going to kill it. I guess I'm going to kill it. All right, let's restart Emacs. I don't know what it was doing. It might take another 60 seconds. Uh, uh, demo. That was pretty bad. Even you know, usually if Emacs hiccups on me, it's just for a second or two. It's usually not that bad. All right, did I save? This is totally the wrong demo. Sorry. It's an old demo. <sighs> okay, here's strings. So, like I said, okay. See, even that, I searched for the thing and it took like a 200 milliseconds to find it. Like, why? This is like a short file. Okay, so um, from shell scripting style languages and, and languages that came out of that, like Perl and whoever, um, we uh, have this idea of here strings where you can declare something and I say hash string which is a compiler directive and then I give a, a keyword that ends the string and then everything up until you find the keyword is in that string so all of this is just quoted exactly new lines spaces and all right you just paste something in there um, and then when you put this down that means the string is over right if I fail to do that uh, like say I typo this, right? I haven't tested this, but uh, there we go. It says unexpected end of file. Um, I don't tell you right now where it started, but that's easy to report. That'll help you debug it, right? Um, this is actually the last line in the file, unfortunately. But, uh, you know, the compiler notices that, right? So um, The reason why this is customizable instead of being something fixed is that you can choose it to be any arbitrary identifier that you know does not occur inside this. And in fact, it has to be the first thing on the line right now. Um, again, whether, uh, you know, notice that all these are left justified. I did that because it's very clear what's going on. Sometimes if you're in code, you might want to have an indented version. I believe like Perl, later versions of Perl have an indented version of this. But it's not clear to me that that's a good idea, actually. Um, but you can imagine an indented version of this. But right now, um, this even has to be the first thing on a line. So I could uh, I could say that in the middle, um, and it still works, right? So in fact, let's show that it printed that. There's our end. So it's not that hard of a problem. You just have to make sure that whatever your token is doesn't end up being the first thing on the line. Okay. Um, you know, here's something uh, in, uh, <laughs> you know, that exercises UTF-8 a little bit more here, uh, and hopefully that came out. I mean, the spacing is obviously messed up. Uh, it's actually looks looks approximately right. Uh, okay, um, our third test is something that has a lot of backslashes in it and stuff. And this is just to point out that if you want to do text that either has backslashes or quotes, right? Quotes are often something you would have to backslash for putting a string. Comments, you don't have to worry about any of that. Like all of that is just verbatim, right? So you don't have to do all this messy, annoying stuff that you have to do in C and C++ with strings, right? So here I even say hell before I say hello, and that's fine, right? We get the hell. All right, test four is just an actual paste of some code just to show that that works. Boom, right? Uh, you might imagine a thing where you have some, you want to unroll a loop a varying number of times to generate several functions with the same loop for different cases. And you might have a preamble that's just some code and a postamble, and you just might want to paste those together like with the same statement unrolled a certain number of times. And so you would want an arbitrarily long amount of code here maybe, right? And that works totally fine. And then here's an empty one. Right, and so uh, 
actually, I guess it, it's not totally empty. It has a new line in it. Uh, maybe it's empty. I think it's completely empty. Yeah, because we print we print a new line before this. <laughs> I should know that. It should be possible to do an empty string this way. So if it, uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's empty. Anyway, so that is here strings. Um, I got a lot happier with strings. Uh, so now let's talk about function overloading. Let's recompile and run. So prior till now, uh, so we're just printing out, you know, a bunch of usual print statements. Prior to now, we haven't had function overloading because I wasn't sure if we were going to need it or if it was the right thing because I didn't want to go slavishly copying other languages. You want to feel out what's the right idea. But I've found at least two different reasons why function overloading is a good idea. Um, you know, one of them is if you're doing uh, generic templated code like this kind of thing, um, if you have function overloading, it means you don't have to have a bunch of ifs predicating the type of your template argument, right? You can just call the function, and the fact that it's overloaded will auto-resolve. It makes, it makes this kind of more generic code much easier to write. Um, the second reason uh, is just that um, it lets you extend functionality uh, without worrying too much what other people's functionality is. Um, so, uh, you know, if you have, just in general, if you have somebody defining some operations on some data in a namespace, right, and they provide uh, some ways of thinking about that data, um, you know, say you've got a vector three and you've got like, um, you've got like length uh, on the vector, or no, um, so you've got two vector threes and you've got uh, you know, um, what do I want to know about them? Um, no, no, no. You know what? Say you've got two line segments. You've got like four vector threes determining two line segments. And you want to know if they intersect, right? And you've got some code and this code sort of determines if they intersect and someone provided it for you and you're kind of using it or Maybe you've just got that library loaded in your namespace, uh, but you want to provide an epsilon in there or um, a certain degree of non-coplanarity that you'll still count as an intersection. And, you know, the previous function doesn't have an epsilon. Um, I don't know. In cases like that, it's useful. I don't want to go... Uh, it, yeah. Anyway, given that it seems useful, uh, the question is how, how should it be implemented? Uh, well, the obvious thing is you just let people define functions, and as long as they take different sets of arguments, um, then you can call the different functions, right? So here I've got a function foo. Uh, one takes an integer, one takes a float, one takes a string. And here, uh, you know, as you can see, uh, we managed to call all three of these, right? So now remember, our print statement is actually pretty generic, and we could just have a function that's templated that just prints the thing, and it would be, we don't actually need to overload to print all these different types of things, but we are. And the way that we're making sure that we called the right one is we print the type here. We're printing string, or printing float, or printing int, right? So you see here we got string, hello sailor, float 2.2, int 5. Now, the first two of these cases are trivial because, uh, you know, we have many fewer implicit conversions in this language than we do in C or C++. So, uh, you know, a string doesn't coerce to a float or an int, so there's obviously only one thing that this could be. 2.2 doesn't coerce to an int under any circumstances, right? It's, it certainly doesn't coerce to a string either, right? It only is a float, so that's fine. But 5 is interesting. So 5 is a literal, and it could be a float, right? If I say... Um, if I, I'm going to say uh, FFF is a float that equals 5, that works, right? Because we want, we want that convenience. See, that compile, I'm not doing anything with that new variable, but uh, now what that means is I could be calling foo of float with this, or I could be calling foo of int with this, but it resolves to uh, int, 
right? And that's because this is a smaller conversion. 5 to int is smaller than 5 to float because it's just defined to be that, right? So there's a few cases where you could have things that could target multiple functions and how do you resolve them, right? That starts to become the implementation question. And we luck out because it's actually a lot easier than most languages because most languages have way more implicit conversions. But there are a few things that we have to handle and we want to handle them because we want it to be convenient to program uh, them, right? So here uh, we've got a function called bar and it takes unsigned integers and there's two versions. There's a 16-bit version and a 64-bit version. Uh, but, but now we're going to pass 8, 16, 32, and 64-bit variables to them, and we're just passing in, uh, we're, set, we're assigning the value to be the number of bits to make it easy to think about so we don't have all these random values floating around, right? So I'm calling bar for all four of these, and what happens? Well, um, the 8-bit number goes to the 16-bit version because that's closer to it than the 64-bit version, right? 16 goes to 16, obviously. 32 can't go to 16 or 8 because those are too small. So it goes to 64, and 64 goes to 64, right? Now that is with variables whose types we declared explicitly. Um, but again, what about implicit stuff? So we can call bar on 10, and note that that goes to the 16-bit version, and we can call bar on 68,000, and that goes to the 64-bit version, right? In 16 bits, the biggest number we could fit is 65535, right? It's unsigned. So anything over 65535, this version is not even a valid overload, right? So it's that version. So the compiler is really pretty smart about uh, what it allows to happen. Now, note that this isn't, um, the reason I say it's being a little bit smart is this is not officially known to be an integer yet, right? Like if you type 68,000, it could be an int, it could be a float, right? Which is it? Well, it depends on context. And so um, we use, uh, we carry through the type inference system the fact that we haven't even decided if this is an int or a float yet, but we do know how big it is, and that eliminates this possibility. If there were a bar of float, uh, that would also be a possibility, but again, the jump from int to float is way bigger than the jump from one size to another, for example. So it would still pick int. All right. Um, now, uh, structures have a similar concept to them, right? So this might be a little weird to read uh, based on how I've got it formatted, but basically I've got all four of these structs have some data. They're just garbage integers that we're not going to use or care about. But the reason I have data there is so I can nest structs inside structs, and they're not quite empty because, I don't know, I just didn't feel like having them be empty. It's a little more realistic to have something in them. So we've got a struct A and then B, which is bigger than A and contains A, right? My A is an A and we're using it, so it's contained in, in us, right? Uh, and C um, is using B and D is using C. So this is our version of doing something a little bit like subclassing in C++, but it's much simpler and more versatile. Um, but we do get implicit conversions on function calls. So you could call a function that takes an A as an argument and pass a D, and the compiler would, would do that for you. Uh, that part of, of inheritance we support, right? Uh, but of course, then you have to deal with that with overloading, and it works the same way. So here we show we have an A that's an A, a B that's a B, a C that's a C, a D that's a D, and we're calling which one on all of these. And this is exactly analogous to our 16 versus 32-bit version, except it's an A and a C. Um, or sorry, it was 16 versus 64-bit before. You could almost imagine, like, this is 8 bits, this is 16 bits, this is 32, and this is 64. And this would be like having an 8-bit version and a 32-bit version. So it's, like, shifted by one of what we did. But we're not talking about bits. We're talking about struct sizes. So, again, um, which one of A is an A? Or, sorry, which one passed an A gets the A, right? So we're printing this out. This is version A of which one, and this is version C of which one, right? And we're saying label is like what we actually passed. So we pass an A, we get which one of A. We pass a B, we get which one of A, because B is too small for a C. We pass a C, we get which one of C, and we pass a D, we get which one of C. So that's all sensible and great. Um, 
Now, all these demos have just had one parameter, but of course, this works with multiple parameters. Uh, so now I've got this thing called multi that takes a U8, a U32, and a float, uh, and a different one that takes three floats, right? And the bodies happen to be the same. We don't really need to do this, right? We're just printing them. Uh, and our print function is versatile enough to handle whatever types of these things are, right? So I call multi with 100, 100, 100, and well, let's look at that, right? So that's calling this U8, U, what was it, 32 and float, right? Um, because these first two numbers are not really floats. Uh, so it, it opts for this one, right? But the third number gets to be a float either way. So that's why we get 100, 100, 100.0. Um, here, we've put a floating point number in the first uh, slot, and the only function that can satisfy that is the second one, so we get that. Uh, in the third one, of course, um, here we actually get the second one because 300 is too big for U8, right? You can only go up to 255. So because this is 300, 300, 300, we get float, 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 because that's the only version of this function that can fit that. Okay. However, right, all of when you have multiple arguments, all of the arguments have the same priority in terms of uh, you know how important they are. So you can have a situation that's ambiguous, right? Um, here, for example, is one we could either take a U8 and a U16 or a U16 and a U8. Um, either one of these involves different distance promotion of these numbers and uh, it's the compiler is not going to be able to decide, right? It's going to say, hey, you match multiple possible overloads, and here are the two. Okay, so um, that's not too surprising. Um, also, my overloads have to be able, you have to be able to disambiguate them based on what the arguments are. Um, right now, we could talk about things about multiple return values, because as I demoed earlier, um, we can do multiple return values in a way that's purely lexical. So we always know if we want multiple values or whatever, and maybe you could figure that out. But it seems very complicated for very little payoff, and this overloads are probably complicated enough already. So I opted at least for now to keep it simple. So um, you know, this the compiler will complain about because it can't tell if you're trying to call this one or this one. Um, and so when you try to declare it, it'll say, hey, they can't have identical argument lists, right? Here's the other procedure, the matching argument list. But if I change this to like a U64, that's allowable, even though for many calls, this is still going to be ambiguous. Like for our 100-100, this would still be ambiguous. Um, that's, a, oh, what did I do? I never tested this exact example. So maybe it's always possible that I have a bug. What am I doing? Oh, I'm trying to return U64s into U16. Sorry. Sorry. That's good. That would have been a loss of information. It's good for the, that wasn't a bug. OK, so now that's allowed, because there are some cases where if you pass a really big number, you might get this one. But if I call this now, right, um, it's hopefully, if it works right, um, going to say, Hey, right? So, hey, procedure call masses multiple possible overloads, right? Now, someone was saying in the chat, I just glanced over and noticed that someone was saying that, hey, best fit does, may produce surprises when, it, when a number changes. Um, now, of course, all these decisions are made statically, right? So it can't be that the variable in, at runtime gets incremented too big. But if you have 2 of 255, 100, right? And then someday you make that 256, it'll call a different routine, right? And yes, that's true. However, if you make a situation where this happens and generates surprising results, you're just abusing overloading, in my opinion. Like, overloads with the same name should be doing basically the same thing. And if, if you do something like overload on size, it should really only be about handling the size. Like, oh, I want to serialize this, and so I'm allocating slightly more data in the stream to serialize the bigger value or something, right? You shouldn't have something that if you pass 255, uh, you know, tells a boat it can start sailing, and if you pass 256, blows up the earth, right? Like, that is 
bad programming. Don't do it. Um, but I, right now, I allow you to do it, right? So um, that's, in my opinion, not what overloads are for. And when overloads get a bad rap, it's because people start doing that, right? Uh, you shouldn't do it. Um, now, there are some other um, aesthetic choices in what we do when we're resolving overloads uh, that I will say um, I'm not 100% sure that these are the right choices, and I want to see how they unfold over time, and maybe we'll change some of them. Anyway, here's how it works when you have overloads in multiple scopes, right? So here, for example, I've got two versions of Baz, and here I've got two versions of Baz. And you could have arbitrarily deep scope nesting. Um, <laughs> Casey made a joke in the chat. He's derailing me. I'm not going to look at the chat till we're over. Sorry. Um, OK. <laughs> so we've got, uh, you know, any time that you have multiple scopes like this, you have to decide what to do. And again, so um, what I decided was this. If you have multiple scopes of things, then probably what is happening is that your, your overloads at different levels are probably authored by different people or different parts, they're being inserted by different parts of the program, right? And so they're aware of different contexts. And what that means is I don't necessarily uh, consider them all in parallel, right? So if you're going to resolve Baz on some element, the way it works is this. You walk upward scope by scope, and in the first step, you consider only these two, right? And if you fit either of these two, at any distance level of implicit coercion, we'll pick that one, right? Because you've gone through the care of defining these locally, so you have a better idea of, of what is happening with your local data types, right? If you venture further upward in scope, um, maybe you imported a bunch of stuff from a math library or a data structure library or whatever, and those all are, are in a higher scope. Um, those were all authored coherently understanding each other and will have maybe slightly different concerns, and those get considered as a unit, right? So um, what I mean to say then is, for example, if I have this U8, even though there's a very good fit for U8 up here, we won't ever look at it. We'll resolve it in the local scope because there are sufficient things at local scope, right? So this is about, if you're looking at me uh, a little dubious, um, what this is about is local reasoning, right? I can reason about what my program is going to do locally without necessarily knowing what is going to happen when other modules are included far away, right? If I define something called Baz locally, then I know everything about what's going to happen when I call Baz, right? Um, if I don't define it locally, then I get whatever is in the global scope or a higher scope. And if you somehow want to do a job of integrating these two scopes, then you need to do that explicitly because that's actually a delicate job sometimes, right? Um, but, it, but again, this, this, uh, this idea that I'm talking about only comes into play when there's ambiguity. When there's not ambiguity, for example, there's a string here, we, you know, that doesn't match these, so like, you just get the global scope thing like you normally would. If you had one with two arguments, you would just get the global scope thing like you would, right? So let's just go look at the output. Um, did I, did I, uh, I didn't, I didn't, uh, do this. All right. So, you know, Baz of the... Uh, what are you doing? Let's just look at this, right? So Baz of the U8 uh, went to the U16 version because that's locally scoped. Baz of the U16 went to 16. Baz of the U64 went to the 64. And Baz of the U32 went to the 64, right? So all of those stayed in our local scope. But the string one went straight through because there's no, there's no ambiguity, right? So again, I'm not 100% sure that that's the right decision. And we have to see how this evolves and what kind of problems happen and, and whatever. But uh, it feels OK to me.
we'll see. If anyone has opinions on this matter, you can send those opinions to this email address. It is not a mailing list. It is uh, me responding to emails sometimes. Sometimes I don't respond because I'm really busy. Uh, OK, the last thing is overloads have to be constant. Um, for example, you can't do something like this. Uh, you know, if you try, so I've got overloads of Baz up there. If I now try to make something that's also, you know, this is effectively a lambda or a function pointer, because if I do that, I say it's constant, right? This is something that's reassignable, so it has memory. Um, and, uh-oh. Uh -oh. Oh no, I didn't check that in. All right, so I played around with maybe wanting to support this, but you can't do this. Um, it's it's you, on my laptop. You get an error message when you try to do that. Um, now, at first, it, it's not that big of a deal because actually, you might think, oh, that's hard because you know if it's one of these bases you generate different code when you call a function, right? Because this is an easier function call and this has to go through a pointer and stuff. But that, that part is actually fine because uh, you, this decision is made statically. So we don't care what value you put in this pointer. We just know that we're looking through the pointer. So that part of code generation is fine with this. The question is just, okay, well, what, what happens if I do this multiple times? You know, I do a different overload, right? Now this suddenly has to be like a fat, function pointer that's arbitrarily fat to store like 50 of these and it just again it's maybe a use case that has some use and you have to disambiguate when you're calling it and if you pass it as a parameter to a function you have to like figure out which uh you know maybe you want to do it and again if you if you can make a very serious case for wanting to do this email me but like what type is it it becomes like an array of function pointers and then is every function pointer an array of function pointers implicitly? Because you can like pass one. I don't, it didn't sound like a good idea for something that's a relatively marginal use thing. I would like to keep overloads simple while making them also powerful, right? And, and while, uh, while encouraging um, good communication between different pieces of code. And this actually, it starts to seem like it'll just make things more confusing. So right now it's banned. So overloads are only for constant functions. Now, there's one last issue. And um, I haven't implemented this, but there is a problem that can creep in with overloads. Imagine we've got some overloads in global scope, right? And for example, you've got one that, that takes a U16 parameter and you pass a U8, right? And you compile that and it's fine. Whoops, I forgot I don't have my other buffer overloaded because Emacs. Say I compile that and it's fine, but then my script does some other things, right? And then it adds another build file down here that adds more overloads. And one of those overloads happens to be a better fit and is inserted into the same scope. You sort of end up with an order of compilation problem at that point. Um, now, I have some decisions of what I can do at that point. I could. You don't want to delay compiling things until you know that that's not true because you can never know. Like you can add new code arbitrarily late in the comp compilation process. And in fact, that's what makes the program powerful. But one thing you can do is the compiler can keep track of all of the non-exact coercions that it did into overloaded functions. And if you ever then load up an overload that's more exact, it can give you a compile time error. Like, look, you can't do this, right? just load that overload earlier or something, right? That seems a little messy, but I don't think that this will almost ever happen in real code. And in the times when it does happen, though, it would really be surprising, which is why I want to catch it. So I'm not doing that yet because it requires a significant amount of bookkeeping in the compiler, but um, that's doable. Uh, the other thing you could do is trigger a recompile of that code, but the question is then, does that sometimes recursively trigger recompiles? Um, I don't think it does yet, but uh, maybe, I, I don't know. It, it's starting to be a very complex language, and so it, it might become surprising uh, what can happen. So for now, it's just verboten. You just can't do that. Uh, but it's actually not verboten yet, because I don't, I don't compile time assert on you. Um, but I will. 
Anyway, that is all of the features for today. So I'm going to take a break of a few minutes, um, get some water, start up a tea, turn on the lights, and then we'll take uh, questions. I'll be right back. Oh, one of the things I want to say while the tea is boiling is um, it's quite possible that we'll get questions of the form, why didn't you do overloading like language XYZ does overloading? And the answer is that I'm not that familiar with how overloading works in any language. In fact, I couldn't even tell, I program in C++ every day for 20 years. I can't actually tell you exactly what the overloading rules are for C++ in multiple, although I guess you can't really have functions at multiple scopes in C++? Uh, you can have namespaces though. So I don't, I don't actually know how that works because I keep it as simple as possible in C++, but you know, you could ask me about why didn't you do like C sharp or whatever. And the reason is because I don't know how C sharp does things. I wanted to approach this from first principles and just see what made sense to do. So um, we could talk about that. If someone thinks a different language is overloading, uh, has some features that are uh, good, then maybe we can talk about those during the Q&A even. Uh, I'll be right back in one minute or so. I have to have, I have to have a cookie. It's a good thing the dog isn't here anymore. He'd be going nuts. He loves these. Okay, let's look for some questions. They're easier for me to see if you do the little at sign and point them directly at me. 
but I will try to pick some out. Can functions with the same name arguments have different return types if the compiler can figure out which one should be called? Yes, they can. Um, I tried to say that, but I may not have been very clear about it, right? As long as, um, oh, well, no, actually, no, sorry. With the same name, okay, the arguments have to be at least slightly different, right? I didn't want to be in the business in general in this language. Um, when it comes to things like inference of types, uh, I have a very like greasy wrench work a day dude attitude about it, which is just that it should be a v type inference should be a very, very simple system that's very easy to understand what it does at all times and should also be maximally powerful given that. Right. So if it's if you start inferring things like based on how a function is called, that starts to be hard to think about. Right. So I don't like that. And, you know, as you start to get more and more non-local with type inference, that's where it starts to get bad. And that's where it starts to get hard to understand what your program is doing. So I don't even want to go in that direction. Um, I don't necessarily see a good reason to give you multiple ways to overload if the parameters are the same, who cares, right? I mean, in in the rare cases where you would do that, you probably have a good reason for doing that. Like maybe one of the return values is expensive to compute and you only want the other one, but use a different name. Like if they actually have different enough characteristics where one is performant and the other isn't, you probably shouldn't just name them the same thing. You should name them different things because they're not doing the same thing, right? They have different uh, properties in terms of where they're appropriate to be called from in the entire program, right? They do different things. So you should call it foo underscore slow and foo underscore fast or whatever, foo and foo underscore skip underscore slow underscore computation or something like that. I don't believe in just overloading stuff unless they're very, very close in terms of what they do. And performance is important uh, the, the, for the intended audience of this language. Performance is important. And that guides a lot of decisions. <laughs> Why is it not called blow overloading? Sorry, man. I don't like making puns about my own name. If you had grown up in grade school being teased about your name every day, you wouldn't make puns about your name. That's all I can say. What happens when you import from module A, which has function baz, and in the same scope import module B, which also has function baz, if those functions have different arguments, like if they're if they're successfully different overloads, it'll be fine. If they're not, you'll get a redeclaration of baz and you'll have to rethink how you're importing, right? I do want to have a keyword accept. I don't have it yet, but I want to be able to say stuff like um, import, this is not necessarily final syntax, but import math uh, accept cosine, sine, and tangent, because I've got my own, right? So I want to be able to say something like that. So if you ended up with a compile time error like that, you could accept the function that was giving you a problem, but you'd have to decide which one to take and which one to leave because they're maybe not the same function. If they are, why are they being provided by both systems? That doesn't make sense. What about overloading with ambiguous type arguments, but if they're named it? No, the names don't matter. Names do not matter in overloading at all. Only types matter. No, overloading on argument names will never be a thing. Oh, although, the actually, I don't know, right? I mean, yeah, you could have a situation where you called explicitly, because we have function calls with explicit named parameters, right? You could disambiguate at the call time that way. But I, and so I could let that just work. And that would be fine, right? Like if I don't, if I don't prevent you from uh, 
if I don't prevent you from declaring both versions of the function, it'll it'll work actually. But I just don't think it's a good idea. Like why? Like I was saying, overloads should be clear. If you get into the territory where you have to start thinking confusingly about what your program is going to do, then overloads are not good in that case. So it, it feels like you're already in a vague situation of unclarity. And I feel like I would rather have the compiler tell me right away when I try to declare something twice. Because that might happen because I don't realize that I imported somebody else who has that function or something, right? So I want to know about that. I don't necessarily want to accommodate this weird use case. But like I said, I might be wrong about what's maximally useful. Um, and especially, so here's the thing is, I've programmed in C++ a really long time and done a certain kind of programming with games in it. And so I have a very strong intuition for what I personally would like and what would make my life better under that kind of system. The thing is, though, once I start having tools that make my life better, that automatically perturbs my position in the state space. And hopefully, if I'm very successful, this language will take me to a new position in the state space that's substantially far from the one that I have 20 years of experience in, which means that my intuition starts to be less appropriate, right? Even for just what I want, much less never minding what would be good for everybody, right? So I'm trying to always be open to that idea that many of these decisions may be wrong and will be overturned at a later time, right? Right now, sort of what we're doing is making, it's sort of the same way I design a game, is you make your best decisions and rough out everything and put the whole thing together, and then you look at how it is and then refine your decisions based on that, which may be quite a lot later into the process. Like some people might say, oh, aren't, aren't you worried about freezing the structure or, or get getting all these bad or, or decisions that are not optimal together and then you're sort of off target and you can never recorrect and it's like no not really because I have experience building complicated things this way actually if Casey's still in the chat you could ask him he played a version of the witness in um, I think I saw a comment from it recently it was like February 2012 or something where it was basically gameplay complete like that was the first time that we had the whole uh, the ending to the game and we sort of knew how the ending was going to go and there were cool puzzles in the ending and then enough other stuff on the island to support the game. There's been a little bit more added around the island for sure since then but it was a full game in February 2012 and three and a half years later we've basically finished the last puzzles, right? That's how much refinement I like putting into design, but it also, that's how much early on I like having the full thing together, like halfway through. So I'm sort of thinking about this that way, like let's get the full thing together and then we'll question these decisions. Uh, so if you, you, you don't even have to ask me questions of the form, might it be someday that this might be slightly different in such a way? Yeah, it might be that way someday. Automatic yes to any questions of that form. In fact, I'll just read the question, I'll start reading it, and then I'll say automatic yes and move on. Consider Rust's from T trait where you can write complex from is complex. I don't even know what that means. The word trait just turns my brain off. Like, it, never mind the fact that it means different things in different programming languages. It's a noun that doesn't mean anything. The word trait is as generic and bland as possible such that it doesn't tell me anything about what the thing is. So I, you, you tell me I, a from T trait, I don't know what that even means. And I've read, I've read the Rust web page explaining what traits are several times and it doesn't stick in my brain. It, it just doesn't. Neither does the C++ definition of trait. I still can't tell you what the hell a trait is. And nothing in this language will ever be called a trait if I ever have anything to say about it. You'll have a more concrete noun that tells you what it does. Or adjective or verb or something, right? Um, so I still, from t, where you can write complex from float r equals complex r comma zero. That looks like a constructor. To, I don't know how that's different from a constructor. That, that's just a fun like why is that a trait that's just a function so, what I don't I don't get it I don't get it <laughs> that looks like a function to me okay I'm skipping down to more recent questions does name lookup for parameter names happen after an overload is selected um, 
No, actually. So uh, what happens is um, for each possibility, you know, so, you know, each name in each scope has a list of possible overloads, right? And that's just all the functions with the same name. And so w for a given procedure call, we try to match up against each function and see if we're valid. So, yeah, if we try to give the wrong names, we'll be invalid um, for a function, even if our types are correct, and we just won't consider that one. Um, so it, it works basically as you would expect. But so, so that's why I'm saying if we wanted to allow ambiguity except by names, we could do that. We, I could just turn that on and that would just work. But I don't feel like it's a good idea. Maybe it is a good idea. Maybe people will want it. Maybe it's a compiler option where you can toggle it. I don't know. Is there a way to say further use data conversion method and you pass a 16 bit number and you want to have the U64 called instead of the U32? I think if you want that cast explicitly to U32, right? If you, where was it? Was it like Baz? If you want Baz of X8 to call the 64 bit version, um, then do this say cast U64. Like, I don't, I don't see that, whoops, I don't see that as a good reason to abuse the overload system or to add more complexities. If you can already do it, do it, right? Uh, you might have some more complex function that returns a string or something, so call that, right? I'm not, you know, a lot of language design goes off the rails when they try to make small operations like this invisible in magic, and they say, look, it's magic. And it's like, yeah, it's magic, but it also makes things really complicated and makes other cases a lot gooier and nastier, and it's, those kind of things are not, in my opinion, worth it. So simple mechanisms that let you do as much as possible, that let you do as much as possible, right? Not where the language necessarily you know, it, like, like I, I categorize that as the language trying to solve the easy problems instead of trying to solve the hard problems. So the goal is attack the hard problems, not the easy ones. Okay. Re-ask due to question probably scrolling off your screen. What happens if there's an ambiguity between an overloaded version of a function in an inner scope and one in an outer scope? Yeah, I tried to explain that. Um, if there is a match at all in the inner scope, of any degree of ambiguity or any degree of distance, the outer scope will not even be looked at, right? And again, that's supposed to be about supporting local reasoning and modularity to some extent. Um, we'll see if that's the right decision. But yeah, if, if anything matches at all, you won't look at the outer scope at all. It doesn't exist. Now, you might think, oh, that's hard to reason about, but it's really not because, like I said, there's not that many implicit conversions. There's just unsigned and signed integers, and then there's float32 to float64. Those are like all of the implicit conversions in the whole... Oh, and then struct containment, like I just showed, like subclassing. That's, that's all the implicit conversions in the whole language right now. I can't see us adding that many more because we don't seem to need them. So... Um, really, the only time this really happens is when you have numbers or subclasses, which is should be easy to think about. And if you make it hard to think about, you may be making a mistake in the way you're structuring your program. But again, we'll see. We'll see how it comes out. Um, can I overload parameterized types? Um, for now, I punted on that. So if you try to do that, I hope I check this in, but... Um, if you try to do this, uh, I don't know. This just it doesn't matter. Just empty. Uh, the compiler will actually yell at you right now. So you can't overload things, but it says yet. I don't like at the end of Flash Gordon. I don't know. Um, you know, uh, maybe this should be possible if it's not ambiguous. It's just this is a complex enough situation that I just said we'll punt on this for now and just try regular vanilla. Let's let's try regular vanilla overloading and see if there's anything wrong there. And, and we'll also be able to consider this as I write code or as other people write code, we'll see situations like maybe we wanted to do this. But right now I'm sort of thinking of this as, uh, again, to keep things simple to reason about, these are um, 
different approaches to handling different argument types, right? Overloading is one approach to handling different argument types that you would use when you want the body of your function to be very different. In this example code, the bodies are usually very similar, but pretend that like the string thing did some body of code and the U8 did a totally different body of code, right? Um, templatized, polymorphic, whatever you want to call it, functions are probably for when you want the body of code to be mostly the same for whatever that type is, right? And just in either case, you would use them. So then mushing all those together doesn't necessarily seem like the right thing to me, so I banned it. But uh, maybe it shouldn't be banned. Maybe it should work. I don't know. We'll see. Someone's asking about debugging. Debugging is a big story that we'll come to later. Um, you have to be able to debug well, I'll say that. It's important. Um, do you have anyone apart from yourself trying to find weird quarter cases in my language? Not yet. I'm the only person who uses it so far. At some point, it will be released to a broader audience, and then we'll have more people doing that. Um, for now, you know, I try to get the weird cases. Like, I thought of that, at least. I thought of what happens if one function's polymorphic and, the, you know, the other ones aren't. Um, you know, I have experience in game design of thinking about corner cases. How are people going to break the game? But I don't think of everything, you know, and there's, there's going to be things. I, in fact, I didn't even think about this one. For some reason, I, sh I should feel embarrassed, but I didn't think about how to define this and what happens and um, et cetera. So it's, it's always good to have other people uh, looking out for you. Um, we'll have more and more of that as there comes to be more of a community around the language, which will happen once more people can actually get it. Right now, nobody can get the compiler right now. Sorry, but that'll happen later. What is the position on null pointers? Well, here's the thing. I would like to... I like the idea of avoiding null pointer references because on the one hand, they're easy to catch. Like it, when, when you have a null pointer crash, it's easy to figure out what happened usually, so they're not that bad. On the other hand, it's really stupid to have, like they're annoying and, uh, you know, they kill your game and um, if you don't have good code coverage in your testing, it's easy to have them in weird corner cases and stuff. So ideally, I would like to protect against null pointer things as well as possible. And so one new thing that, or kind of new thing that some languages are doing is having option types or wh whatever you want to call them, union types. Uh, and I, I might envision a simple way of doing that where you could declare a pointer as being nullable or not. Now the problem with that is initialization of structs because I don't want to force you to use a constructor because that's way too C++ for me. I want to be able to declare a struct and assign initial values to it and then use it. And if that is, uh, if I do it the way I do now where you just say, you know, um, f is some struct f and then f dot a equals whatever, right? You could never have a non-nullable pointer in here because you're assigning it um, to things which may well not, I don't know. Um, let's say it's at least probably null before you assign it. <laughs> let's put it that way. So how could it be non-nullable between here and, and here, right? Um, now, there's ways of getting around that, like having certain construction, you know, maybe I say f equals blah, 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 right? Or maybe this has to happen here if you have non-nullable pointers. And maybe you do this by name, so you say pointer equals x, whatever, right? Um, that could work, and we could consider that, but it's one of those things where I'm not sure if the friction is worth the upside. Maybe it is. Maybe it's awesome to not have nullable pointers. Um, maybe it's not so awesome. And I have no experience using them. And I basically don't believe what anyone says about what's good in programming because all of the advice that I've ever been given in my life, not all of it, but almost all of it is wrong. Like I disagree with over 80% of programming advice that I've ever gotten in my life, which includes 
college, you know, a good university like computer science at University of California at Berkeley, which is not supposed to be a bad CS program. Uh, I disagree with almost all of it. And so, or at least in the cases where I agree, I have a much more nuanced opinion about things that I were told about how is the right way to do things. And so therefore, I'm not too eager to jump into things that seem like panaceas, because they almost never are. So that's my opinion. I want to do some experimentation on non-nullable pointers. Um, I want to at least have it be an experimental language option where you could turn it on and try it out. Uh, but I have no conclusions about whether it'll be in the language for real, as opposed to an experimental option. Would I include optional arguments are already in the language? Watch the past broadcast. How are we currently handling strings? Do we malloc or do we cache string con? No, strings are right now exactly C strings in terms of how they behave in memory. So when I, when I do this thing, like this hello sailor, this is not one of these crappy languages that allocates a hello sailor string to like, pa no. This under the hood, so this string is, is basically the same as an array of U8 under the hood which means it gets passed sort of as two arguments to this function, right? There's a, there's a length argument and a data pointer argument. But the difference between doing that by hand in C++ and doing it here is here the compiler knows those things are together, right? And can reason about it. Um, so, uh, but there's no allocation, right? The data is just the string data and we don't copy it. And you notice I'm not, I'm not giving you an operator like plus or something. I could do that now. Now that we have that con that local context where you store allocators, I could put a local allo alloc a function in there or something like that where we define things like this as doing temporaries that might uh, get automatically deallocated on return. I don't know. That starts to be a possibility once we have that context pointer, but I'm, I'm staying away from that for now. This is just a C string. If you want to copy it, you copy it explicitly, right? So I, um, at some point I do this sprint function, right? Or mprint, no. Oh, it's in the other file. I'm so confused, right? So here I'm calling sprint where I'm concatenating the path of the file onto this, right? And this is actually allocating memory, and I'm actually leaking it here because I don't care uh, because this is a build step, and I know I'm not doing very much, and I, who cares? Just leak it. Uh, but um, usually when I do that, though, I do this. I just didn't do it this time. Um, But that, that won't happen in, you know, the reason why this happens is because sprint is an explicitly allocating function, and I know that, right? If you want to copy a string, copy the string. That's my opinion, and I don't want invisible, weird, wacky copies or concatenations or things like that. Do you explicitly type ints automatically convert to float for overload resolution? No. If you declare something as an int, whether signed or unsigned, it will not implicitly convert to a float ever. For, not for overloads or anything, right? Once it's known to be an int, you have to cast it explicitly. The only time something that looks like an int can become something like a float is in this case where it's a literal. Uh, or, right, or you can have a constant that's a literal right? I haven't declared the type of this constant, so n is just 4. It's 4 with no further elaborating information. So you could say f as a float is n, and that actually works. Let me, let me actually print that. Print f is, right, and that should print 4.0. There we go. f is 4.0, right? Um, so that works, but that works because this is not a fully concrete type yet. Um, but you can't say uh, n is an int that's 4, and f float is n. That will fail, right? Mismatch float versus integer. And that's uniform throughout the language, always. Will not happen. Um, I'm fighting with the Twitch chat. 
Am I going to have swizzling built in like in HLSL? I don't know. Um, it seems like more like a standard library thing, and you want the compiler to be powerful enough to let you define that. Um, do explicitly typed ints automatically convert to float? Oh, wait, that's the one I just answered. How do we avoid hashtag hell? How much of a concern is that? I don't think there is such a thing so far. I'm not worried about it. I don't see that as a problem. Um, do function pointers take precedence over constant functions when resolving? No, as I believe I tried to say, you just can't do that. You can't overload a function pointer with a constant function. Compiler will reject it. Um, it didn't give an error message when I showed it, but that's because I didn't check in from my laptop. Um, actually, let me let me go. Uh, <laughs> I can go do that right now just to put put my soul to rest. Uh, uh, where is it? It's in um, parser.cpp, and it's uh, uh, it's this. Okay, so I just recompile, and see, I'd already I already put in the test. Okay, so now I just have to do the thing with the baz. Oh, I deleted the oh here. So here's our non-constant overload. Hey, it complains. So that is not legal currently and may not ever be legal. What is the type of X double colon? Someone's asking, what is the type of this? The answer is, um, right now, you can't actually do that uh, because I don't. One of the things that I've been saving till later is that I just don't support uh, well, okay, it, it depends. Okay, this depends on context, I think. Actually, I can do this in a local scope like this, I believe. Yeah. So I can do that in local scope um, because it's in an expression scope and I'm running code. So what this does is it runs code and it just says, okay, this is an int and this is an int. And if you don't put any further constraints, it gets casted to the default int eventually, which is 64 bit signed, right? So, uh, the type of X is going to be signed 64-bit in this case. Um, you actually can't currently do this at this scope because we don't run code at that scope yet without a run, an explicit run directive. So if you do that, it'll barf on you, right? Um, that's something that we should support because all the time you want to say stuff like n plus 1 and, you know, um, we should support that. I believe... I think I can do this. Please don't barf. Yeah. So that works. If I explicitly say to run this, then I can do it. And let me um, let me go to main. Let me give that a better name than X, right? Uh, global X. And at the end of main, let me say print global X is that. Okay, that triggered an assertion of something I didn't do yet. So, yeah, that's something for my to-do list. But, you know, so in principle, the message is just in general at global scope. I've stayed away from having stuff where code executes and you're not clear about it. That's all. But that run directive should have worked. So that's a bug that that didn't. This, this I believe, should have worked. Maybe. Let me, let me see. What if, I, what if I do this? No. It's the same problem. All right. Um... Yeah, I don't think that's due to any. All right, so I have a problem that I've introduced with run directives lately. It's not that surprising. Um, it's probably just a dependency problem, like, you know, global X is not defined yet, uh, and this function is... 
upset for some reason that it's trying to use a symbol that's bound to a run directive. Uh, I've demoed that working in the past, and it'll work again. If you remember when I the first time I demoed run directives, we basically did this where we assigned a... Oh, no, that was in a local scope, actually. I don't know. Anyway. More questions? Will there be support for closures? Maybe. Probably. Uh, but... Um, it's not important. Closures are not necessarily as all critical as some people would have you believe. Um, and I'm not sure, again, um, they can become a very error-prone construct and a very complicated construct. So I'm delaying them for a while because there's more important things to do first. Uh, but I probably will do them eventually. Probably. Can I bring outer scope into inner scope? Yes. Uh, well, that's an interesting question. Um, I actually haven't tried that yet, and there may need to be a little more compiler code to handle this. Uh, if you try to using... Actually, it might just work. I need to try it. So if you try to use something that's overloaded, though, right now you can't using a specific version of it. You can only using all the overloads under that name. And again, should you be able to do that? Maybe. I don't know. If you do, we'll support it. It's unclear. You know, it's very easy to go down a path of like, oh, you ought to be able to do this and ought to be able to do that, and they turn out to be things that you don't really matter. So that's the question is, given the desire for simplicity, where does that land? Should you be able to do that? Pick out individual ones out of the overload and only use that one, or should you not? And I don't know the answer to that. Why not take a compile time validation approach to array bounds checking? Well, we may do that also later, um, like a, some kind of other approach. This is does not mean, that th the fact that we have a runtime checking does not mean that we won't ever have compile time checking also. However, if you start going down the road of doing the things that you need to do so that your compiler can statically check as many arrays as possible, you start to get a language that's very cumbersome to program in. And the question becomes, is that trade-off worth it, at least for your application domain, right? Um, it becomes much more expensive the more friction you have to write software, right? It becomes less expensive the less you have to debug, and that makes some curve, right? And where on the curve do you want to land? So um, I don't know exactly, but most of the languages that I've seen that go bananas about trying to reason about values in the type system are a nightmare to program in, in my opinion, and I wouldn't want to go that way with this language. Um, however, if you wanted to, by the time we're done, the compiler is probably expend extendable enough, <laughs> expendable enough, the compiler is probably extendable enough that you could probably make it happen if you wanted to. I'm not convinced it's a good idea, but you can make it happen. Someone is saying the example case for polymorphic plus overload is a function like print, which prints arrays of printable things and trees of printable things. We actually already can do that with our print function without overloading or polymorphism actually, with the, with the, uh, the any type and the type safe verargs that we have. That's a whole, you can watch those demos if you want. We already print trees of information and scalars with our print function, and we didn't even need any of this stuff that I demoed today, or we didn't need any of the polymorphism. So, yeah, I don't think we needed it. We certainly didn't need it. We might have used it. I don't remember. Can we prefix or suffix constant literals to specify their memory footprint? No. Um, no, because I like simplicity. If the need arises to do that, um, we may make a way to do it, but I don't think it should be necessary. You already have a way to say what type something is, and it might be a little verbose, but if, if you want it, we don't even have this initialization form yet, but say you were initializing something. And you wanted to make sure that like this one was 64 bits. I don't want to do like that. Like that's garbage. I, I, no, it's not garbage, but it's annoying. And you just don't need it when you have so many other ways of talking about things. 
you already have this. Although, um, although cast is a slightly, you might have different flavors of cast at different levels of strength, but just introducing more and more notations when they're not necessary, and you don't even use that one that often, is maybe not so great, right? Part of the reason that you use that more often in something like C is because the, you know, the way types get assigned to things is not necessarily fortunate. Um, and we're building a system here that should have much better default behavior so that hopefully you don't need suffixes anyway. But again, I might be wrong about that. We'll see. Uh, what about having multiple pointer types? That's what I said. The no ABC block directive reminds me of the old capture pure function syntax. There will be something for talking about read only or pure or something. Yeah. Um, that'll happen a little later. I have some ideas about what that is, but that is going to happen after even something else that's more exciting, in my opinion. So we've got a few more demos yet before we start talking about pure functions and whatnot. Although, actually, no. Actually. Actually. There will be a surprise. OK, anyway. Can you just add u before the string to indicate is it a Unicode character string? No, because all strings are Unicode character strings. Every string is UTF-8. This string is UTF-8 without exception, the end, no w care BS and no whatever's No. In fact, the whole file is UTF-8 by definition, right? When you use this file extension and load this into the compiler, the compiler knows it's a UTF-8 file, so you can use UTF-8 characters in the identifiers and whatever. That's just it. Simplicity, the end. Someone saying, hey, it's Kanukakakul saying, hello, barely grazed by the stream, but I'm very hyped by the language. Thanks for your streams and efforts. Thank you for hanging out and watching. It's very nice to see people come by. I haven't done one of these streams in months, but still over 200 people came, and uh, that's cool. So next time, this time was sort of a grab bag of stuff, and next time is more like one really big feature instead of several small features. So we'll see how that goes. I don't have a date for next time, don't ask. I'm going on vacation for a couple weeks soon, so don't expect it within less than a month, certainly. And we're working hard on the witness to get it out the door, so, you know, it may take some time. Uh, James is saying, I really like the scope control in C++. We have a horrible situation where you can get surprising name lookup results. Not having that and not being able to selectively filter out names is good. Maybe. I hope so. I mean, that's why I made this choice. But honestly, it's, it's a guess. I'm guessing that this is right. I'm not even, like I said, that familiar with the C++ behavior in these types of cases simply because I just don't like to go, whenever I'm programming, I just don't like to go that far down complexity road, right? Um, sometimes you have to because you're integrating a bunch of components from people or something. But... Um, I, I don't ever use namespace in C++. That's like not a keyword that I ever even use because I don't like the way it's done. So I don't run into that kind of problem. And then once you don't use namespace and you can't really declare a local function, <laughs> the problem sort of doesn't happen, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm not, I, I don't want to go out there and say, this is the right solution and other people's are wrong. May, maybe. This is my guess at, at a good solution. Again, um, I'm big on local, the ability to locally reason about what your program will do, right? You want to look at your local scope. Because assume your program is infinitely big, right? Or close to infinitely big. You want to be able to constrain your search for understanding of what the program will do to a local piece of the program as much as possible, right? That's why I, I don't want, you know, remote overloading namespace confusion. I don't want exceptions, because exceptions are the granddaddy or the grandmama of non-local reasoning. Um, I don't want the come from statement, right? 
that's come from is bad news. Uh, things like that. So, uh, yeah. I think I'm just about done with questions. My voice is giving out, and I've been here a long time. I'll check for a last couple. Can you overload functions based on properties of types like signed and unsigned? Yes, I didn't demo that, but um, signed and unsigned would work the same as the different properties um, that I showed. If you have something, however, that could cast a signed or unsigned of the same size, the compiler doesn't have a preference. Like if you set 100 casting to a signed date or an unsigned date, that would be ambiguous and you'd get an error at the calling site because the compiler didn't know which one you meant. When did I start programming? Um, I started when I was 10 years old, uh, but if you started when you were 17, that's not too late because, man, I didn't start programming for real real at full tempo until um, age 24, I want to say. 20, late 23 or early 24 was when I started getting into games and really like let the engine rev at full speed. Prior to that, when I was a kid, like in high school, I would spend a lot of time programming and stuff. But back then, we didn't have good access to information. So I was sort of got to the point where I was programming in assembly language on the Commodore 64 and the TRS-80 color computer, but um, I was limited in what I knew how to do, and there was no one around me who even was doing that, who I could talk to, that I knew. Um, so my learning like plateaued kind of early and stagnated for several years. So um, now, if you started at 17 and you have all the resources of the internet at your disposal, um, that is huge. And uh, you can probably learn faster than people of my generation did. If you apply yourself. you got to apply yourself. <laughs> when is The Witness coming out? Um, we may have decided on a release date today. Uh, prior to today, we didn't decide on what the release date is. Uh, I don't know when we're going to announce it. Um, we may announce the release date by the end of this month. Uh, but it is it is far enough along that we have a plausible release date, like to the to the day, and not like qu some quarter in some year. So we'll see. All right, I'm I'm tired of a asking questions. I'm sorry that I'm leaving some unanswered, but I gotta go. Thank you everybody for coming. Uh, this will be on YouTube if you missed part of it, um, and uh, that's it. I'll try and do another one of these before too long, but like I said, I have some other things happening that need attention. So, uh, but thank you. And again, as all, excuse me, as always, if you have questions, comments, if you work at Intel and you want to fund an awesome language that has native SOA support and is going to be a contender for very high performance, low level programming with great deal of uh, programmer control and you want to give us you know, $10 million to fund a team to work on this, email me at this address and uh, you know, we can talk. If you have ideas for how overloading should go, if you have uh, ideas for something else, do not email me if you want to talk about semicolons or indentation or 16-bit unicode string support with code pages so you can talk to Windows. Don't ask me about any of those things. I will not read your email. But other subjects, <laughs> uh, no bike shedding, other subjects are welcome. Thank you, everybody, and good evening, good morning, whatever time it is where you are. <laughs>